Hand Production. Northwestern Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association presents. Varroa mites. At this time, uh, we have a real special guest who had good sailing and good driving all the way from uh, New Hampshire. Is that right? Uh, east, eastern part of New York. Eastern so part of New York. Next to the border with Vermont. Very good. So this is Dr. David Peck. He's a postdoctoral associate at the Department of Entomology at the University of Cornell. Uh, he's also associated with the Better Bee as a director of research and education. He is a, uh, an expert on this bugger, okay, and he's going to uh, present on that. All right, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me through the mic here? Yep. All right, great. Uh, so I should clarify, I'm, I'm actually uh, no longer a postdoctoral associate at Cornell. I'm the director of research and education at Better Bee. I'm also an affiliate of uh, the Cornell Veterinary College's uh, Honeybee Health Program. So I, I'm still, you know, I've still got friends at Cornell, I still do some things there, but uh, my primary day-to-day uh, -day is spent at Better Bee. Um, so what I'm here to talk to you about today are, uh, as you say, those nasty little buggers, these varroa mites, um, that I think a lot of folks spend a lot of time thinking about, maybe some folks should spend more time thinking about, but that not many people know all that much about. And so I want to start with the question that a lot of people asked me during my doctoral research at Cornell in uh, Professor Tom Seeley's lab, which is, why are you studying for all? Why should you study these animals? Uh, and so obviously everybody said, well, that's why, right? You're just going and you want, to, you want to study them so that you can kill them. And that's a perfectly reasonable answer that someone might give. It is important that we know how to kill these parasites. But I think that in order to be a good beekeeper, in order to really control varroa mites, you need to know more about them as animals, as creatures. Understand what the life of a varroa mite is like so that you can then engineer its death. So what I'd like to do today in the time that I've got with you is do a couple of things. I, I want to explore the most important aspects of varroa biology that I think would, can help you manage varroa mites in your colonies better. I want to talk about, or rather, I want you at the end of this presentation to be able to talk about some of the pros and cons of different mite control strategies uh, that you might attempt. And then I want you to develop your own varroa management plan. Uh, I don't know what you want to do. You can decide what you want to do. You'll see if it works or if it doesn't. But I want you to have a plan at this time of the year so that you're not caught by surprise by the mites later. So this is where I like to start this story, because it really is a story uh, about these animals and how they came to be pests on our bees. Who knows what we're looking at here? Shout it out. What's the, the red line that we see traced across here? It's the Trans-Siberian Railway. Yeah. This was completed in 1916. A lot of things happened in Russia in 1916. But uh, one of the things that happened was they completed this railway. And it meant that the Soviets, when they eventually had control over the country, were able to take beekeepers from Western Russia, and they were able to introduce them to beekeepers in Eastern Russia. Because it turns out there had been people keeping bees in Western Russia and Eastern Russia. And they thought, well, these Eastern Russian beekeepers, they don't make all that much honey, their bees seem like they swarm all the time, so why don't we take some of our really good bees from over here by Moscow, and bring them over and then increase the, uh, increase the productivity of their beekeeping. Well, the problem is, what they didn't realize is that those honeybees sure looked similar, they sure behaved similarly, but they weren't the same species of honeybee. It was two different species. In Eastern Russia, you have Apis serrana, which is called the Eastern or Asian honeybee. And then in the West, they had Apis moira, those are the Western honeybee, that's what we keep. And so they thought maybe they could hybridize them or they could have some great breeding program and it didn't work. It never could have worked because you can't hybridize two different species of bee. And the problem is, the Russians made that mistake. Uh, this is our best understanding of how this happened. But they weren't the only ones that made a mistake. They weren't the only ones that got those bees confused with each other. There was also Varroa destructor. Or rather, at that time, it was a parasite called Varroa jacobsoni. It was just an incidental little parasite of the Asian honeybees. It didn't really cause any harm to them. They weren't a very serious pest or a very serious threat. But those parasites jumped onto the Western honey. 
issues. And when those rankings gave up their project and started moving these back and forth and saying, oh, you know, heck with this, let's go back to Moscow, they wound up transporting these parasites that were now riding around on a new host, a new species of bee that they had never been on before. Uh, and so I'd like to show this graph. It's going to show you starting down here in uh, Indonesia, uh, the first uh, locations where these varroa mites are, are documented, the first time varroa mites are found in these places. So they were first described in Asia as sort of a curious pest in the early 1900s. But in 1949, a Soviet university professor received a male varroa mite. Uh, and somebody said, I found this on my bees. I don't know what it is. Can you help me identify it? They confirmed that these parasites were throughout Asia. That's no surprise. That's the native range. But they also started finding them in Germany and then immediately in Paraguay. Folks in South America and Europe were mailing bees and queens back and forth to one another. And so they spread this parasite almost instantly. Um, they spread throughout Europe, they spread throughout South America. In 1987, they're found simultaneously in Florida and Wisconsin. And then the next year, they're found in Canada. They, they, some bees just swarmed over the border, and that was how they got there. Uh, in, oh, I've already missed it, not in Great Britain. Um, I always get, it goes so fast that I get lost. So North Island, New Zealand in 2000, the South Island, New Zealand in 2006, Hawaii in 2007. And then uh, there's a few sites in East Africa, and I think this is where this animation ends. I actually spent a few uh, months living in Madagascar and studying their native honeybee species, their native honeybee uh, race, um, because they only recently have also had varroa arrive. So right now, the only places that really don't have varroa are Australia, the island of Newfoundland in Canada, and then a few little sites dotted around the world, the Isle of Man in the UK, and I think there, there may still be uh, an island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, well, I heard that they may have gotten to Mauritius. So what we know from this is that Varroa are really good at spreading. They, they have spread, and they spread very quickly. But it's also important to know that your bees, our bees, my bees, in the United States haven't had Varroa any longer than since 1987. And they didn't spread instantly and immediately. So your bees might not have had them for a few years after that. So let's talk about the biology of this animal that we're fighting, this new pest, this new threat that our bees haven't been used to, they haven't had a lot of time to adapt to. Uh, so what do we know about this creature? Well, we can take a look at it and see that it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight legs. It's an arachnid, not an insect. So it's a mite that's more closely related to a, a tick than it is to a honeybee. That means they don't have antennae. They can't smell the environment the way our bees do with their antennae. Instead, they actually use these hairs that are sticking out of their forelegs, and they smell the environment with those hairs. They're able to sniff around and say, hmm, that smells like a honeybee, oh, that doesn't, I'm going to avoid that. They have to be able to smell pretty well because they can't see. They don't have eyes. We're all mites are completely blind. So everything that they do, all these things we talk about, you have to understand this is a blind animal that's doing it. They, they uh, benefit from being blind because this whole apparatus here is their head and their mouth parts. And the way that they feed is that they actually jam those, those these little leg-looking things right inside the honeybee through the exoskeleton. And that's how they're extracting nutrients from the bees. And so this is, this is the enemy that we're fighting. This is the creature that we've got to wrap our heads around. Uh, this is the slightly less intimidating photo of them. This is my big, scary varroa mite. And this is just a cute little varroa mite on a, on a drone pupa. But it's important to think about the relative scale of these animals, right? If this is a varroa mite on my body, this doesn't feel like a tick that's feeding on me. If I'm a honeybee, this feels like a big blood-sucking rat that's trying to, trying to you know, ruin my day. <laughs> and so it's critical to understand that this is a really serious pest of bees. And it's almost impressive that they very rarely actually directly kill the bees that they feed upon. We'll talk about in a moment why it's really much more important that they are transmitting diseases between these bees when they bite them. So let's focus again on, on their biology. Let's talk about these two different behavioral modes that varroa mites can live with it and that they sort of alternate between most of the time. You've got the reproductive mode where the mite is going into capped brood. It's reproducing. And then when that, that weakened but still alive bee chews out of the cell, it's got some, some baby varroa mites and the, the mother varroa mites on it. They also have what we call the phoretic, or the dispersal life mode, this behavioral mode, where they're going to be riding around on adult bees, and, uh, typically wedging themselves underneath the underside of their abdomen, and then feeding on an organ inside the bee called the fat body. 
uh, which is sort of like a it's sort of you know where the bee keeps their their extra fat reserves. It's also sort of like the liver of the bee, but that's the organ that these these mites are sticking their mouth parts into and slurping out. And so we we as far as we can understand and as far as we've been able to study, we expect that the typical mite probably goes through about three reproductive cycles over the course of her life. And in general, it seems like they tend to alternate between these modes. So a mite reproduces, then she comes out, she rides around on a bee for a while and feeds as a phoretic mite, then she goes back into another cell and reproduces again. So let's talk about exactly what's happening here. What are these mites up to? So what we can see here is our, our mother of all right in part one who's going to smell that this is a, a bee pupa, or rather, rather a bee larva that's just getting ready to be capped. So sort of and so she's going to run down and she actually hides herself down amongst the remaining food inside that cell. So when this cell gets capped, it's actually going to be sealing this varroa in with this, this you know, um, uh, totally naive uh, baby bee who's going to eat the rest of that food and suddenly find that there's a, a varroa mite crawling around in there. So when that bee then begins to pupate, the varroa mite will start to feed. And so her first meal is taken to the, the bee, and then she's going to go and find a place to relieve herself after that meal. And she's going to spend the rest of her time in this cell feeding on the bee and relieving herself in the same location. Uh, the, the, the first egg that she lays is an unfertilized egg, and it grows up into a male. Even though they really aren't related to each other in, in any meaningful way, varroa mites and honeybees use the same sex determination system. You've got an unfertilized egg that's growing up into a boy. You've got a fertilized egg that's growing up into a girl. And so the varroa mites, just like a queen bee, are able to lay one egg that's going to come out as a male, and then a series of, of eggs that follow that are going to come out as females. Um, and so as these young mites are feeding, they're all going to, to take their, uh, their meals. They're going to go, and they will also relieve themselves at the same location that their mother has been relieving themselves. What these mites are doing is actually sort of building themselves a landmark. It's the only thing that they can control inside that cell. And so when these mites reach sexual maturity, the brothers are going to mate with their females. And so we've got this incestuous mite orgy taking place in a pile of their and their mother's species. It's a really interesting biology here. Uh, and so as, they, as these female mites are impregnated by their brother, they are now ready to go. They'll take one last meal from the bee. And as this bee crawls her way, or his way, and these, these are drones I think in this picture, as this, this drone chews his way out of the cell and crawls out, what you'll see is that the mother mite rides away on him. All of the pregnant, now, now you know, yeah, impregnated female mites that were just born ride away. And all of the young mites, and the male mite, and all of the immature mites, they're just left behind. They're just left behind like so much trash that the bees have to clean out to get that cell ready for the queen to make use of it. If you're trying to figure out whether or not you've got mites reproducing in your colony, one easy thing you can do is look for guanine. Guanine is just these little white speckles, this little white residue that you can find on sometimes the tops of a few of your brood, brood frames, if you heard the cells in one of your brood frames. If you take that frame out and tip it so that you're looking up at the top of the cell, what you're looking at is that pile of mite feces that has been building up over the course of their reproduction. Um, so we talked about reproduction, now let's talk about the phoretic mode, or this dispersal mode, where they're riding around on bees. I really like to use this photo. I took this <coughs> experiment that I did at Cornell, where we were trying to essentially watch a colony in an observation hive die from the roll mites. So we just bred as many mites as we possibly could, and we gave them to these bees, and then we watched what happened. I like to use this photo here because it emphasizes something really, really important. These are all varroa mites circled here in red. that are riding around on the undersides of the abdomens of the four bees that you can see who are walking around on this piece of glass in my observation hive. What I want you to notice is all of the bees that aren't circled. All of these bees who've got their backs to you that don't have any visible varroa mites on them. Do you think that the varroa mites in this incredibly mite riddled colony are only on these four bees? Or do you think perhaps because we're seeing all of these mites on the undersides of those bees, where we know the mites spend a lot of their time, that there are probably just as many mites on these bees that we can't see. So we'll talk a little bit about monitoring for varroa mites later on. But one thing that really grinds my tires is when folks say that they're 
monitoring for varroa mites because they just want to frame and look at it and they don't see any. Well, unless you're picking those bees up and flipping them around and looking at the underside of their abdomen, you're not going to see any of these mites. Uh, and, and this is just a, a further illustration of that. There are three varroa mites in this uh, portrait of a sort of blurry photograph. But what you can see is here's a mite who's starting to wedge itself underneath the, the uh, abdominal plates on the underside of that bee. Here's another varroa mite who stuffed herself about halfway underneath those abdominal plates. And then here's a varroa mite, you can only just see the back of her, of her body sticking out. The rest of her is wedged right up in there. She stuck her mouth parts in the thinnest part of the bee's exoskeleton, where those plates meet and overlap with each other, and she's now feeding on that bee. So this is a mite that not only would you as a beekeeper probably not notice, it's a mite that this bee is going to have a really hard time grooming out of her body. They're not just wandering around on those bees lackadaisically. They're in there, they're feeding, and they are putting themselves in very protected little spots. So we talked about this, the history of this animal and how it jumped from Avis serrana, the Asian honeybees, Avis mellifera. It's important to understand that in the old host, in the old honeybees, the mites only infest to drone brood. They can smell the difference between a young male bee and a young female bee, and they only go into the drone brood and that's because in a Serrana, workers develop very quickly, and drones take a much longer time to develop. The same is true in our bees, but it's more dramatic in the Asian honeybees. And so if a varroa mite went into a worker cell, she wouldn't be able to get a mature male and a mature female offspring that could mate with each other before that bee crawls out of the cell and is ready to, to live its life. So they only go into the males. Uh, what's also interesting is that if two varroa mites go into the same drone cell, they have this behavior, the bees have this behavior called entombing. They can smell that something's going wrong in that cell. And instead of opening it up, they actually pack extra wax over the surface of the cap, and they suffocate the drone, but also all the mites that are inside it. So this means that if the mite population gets too high, they start doubly infesting those limited drone cells, the bees actually have a system to, to tamp that back down. In our honeybees, they, they can make more daughters in a drone cell than in a worker cell because they're sitting there laying those eggs, those young mites are growing up and feeding, and so as long as you've got plenty of time as that bee is developing, you can grow up, mate with your brother, and then live the rest of your grow of mite life. And so the, they preferentially go into drone brood, but they can still successfully reproduce. One mite can have at least one pregnant daughter come out with her uh, from a worker cell as well. So as I said, the real harm that these mites cause isn't in the nutrition that they slurp out of our bees. Our bees can recover from that. The real harm is in the viruses that they're transmitting between bees. So when varroa mites feed, they transmit things like varroa, uh, deformed wing virus. Varroa destructive virus 1 is just a, a subtype of that. They might transmit sac root virus, or chronic bee paralysis virus, or I don't have to prove to you that I've memorized a bunch of names. It's not that impressive. <laughs> The point is, there's a lot of these viruses that we've studied that we know that varroa mites can transmit and even sort of amplify, increase the levels of inside a colony. And there are other viruses we probably haven't ever discovered. We haven't named them, but they're there. They're being transmitted by these mites. What's happening is you've got a mite who's biting the oldest bee in a colony and then going and biting the youngest baby developing bee in the colony and then biting the oldest bee and then biting the youngest bee. So they're, they're transmitting these viruses and they're spreading them to bees that might otherwise have never been exposed to these viruses before. So the viruses themselves can really do a lot of harm to our bees. And I want to illustrate that with this, this graph here that I've, I've borrowed. So what we can see here is a graph that, that tries to show a very rough approximation of the bee population in a colony and the mite population in a colony. So over here, we've got this yellow line that's going to show us our bees. We start in January. There aren't that many bees in January. Over the course of the spring, the population builds. Then we reach a peak sometime in June or July. And then the population tends to decline a bit. They're not building tons of more you know, new forages. They're just getting ready for winter. So it declines over September, October. And then by December, you're right back to your spring starting level of bees. Over here, we have the light population. And what we can see is the light population is at its lowest in the spring, but as that bee population grows, as there's more and more and more and more generations of brood, the mites have more and more and more opportunities to grow. So this mite population will grow exponentially as long as the bee population is growing. Well, mites don't all die the next day, so when the bee population starts to 
fly, those mites are still kicking around, looking for somewhere to reproduce. And so they're hitting these bees that are being born you know, these last couple of generations particularly hard, because you've got what might be a 40,000 mite bite population in a 40 or 35,000 uh, bee bee population. They can really, really do a lot of harm you know, in this model scenario. And as I said, it's not the mites, it's the viruses that are causing the harm. And so what we really need to do is, is illustrate the graph like this. We need to look at the area underneath this curve for these varroa mites. And what we see here is that essentially all of this shaded area is showing you how much mite feeding is taking place inside your colony over the year. It's showing you how much virus transmission has had an opportunity to take place. So if I am a beekeeper, and I go in and I say, oh, I've got high grow mites, better treat them because it's the middle of September. I can take this mite population line and I can plummet it all the way down to zero if I use the right treatment in the right way. But I haven't solved my overall problem because all of this feeding that happened from January, February, March, all the way through to the middle of September when I treated all of these incredibly high levels of, of mite feeding and reproduction that have been happening, that's all leading to a high virus population that I can't treat very easily. I can kill varroa mites with chemicals or management techniques. It's a lot harder to kill those viruses. So my recommendation to you is that if you're managing your varroa mite population, you don't need to kill them all at the perfect time of year. You need to keep your mite population low so that you don't have these spikes, you don't have these opportunities for dramatic virus transmission. So, we're talking about virus transmission. Let's talk about varroa transmission for a second, because I find this really an interesting question. So, one question we could ask is how do these mites get from B to B? It's actually not that complicated. They just crawl. They can just go from one bee down onto the comb and then jump up onto another. This happens all the time because we know that if I'm right here on this bee, if she starts getting older, she's not a nurse bee anymore, she's getting ready to go forage. If I'm a rural mite, I don't want to go out and forage. I don't want to be out there. I want to be in here on a nurse bee feeding and getting ready to jump into the next brood cell to reproduce. And so I, I can just jump onto a, a nurse bee. I can smell the difference just like the bees can smell the difference between each other. This is a more interesting question to me. How do rural mites spread from one hive to another hive? I've got a hive that's got varroa, and I've got a hive that doesn't. How do I wind up with two hives that have varroa mites? Well, there's one easy way to spread, and that's if I've got a swarm of bees that are leaving an infested hive, they're going to carry the mites with them. And so when they move into an empty box, now I've got two boxes with mites, or once I had one. This isn't all that uh, interesting to us, because we know that you know one sick animal splitting in half and creating two, two colonies is, is going to have some of their same parasites. But this gets more interesting, this idea of horizontal transmission. Spreading my mites from the colony that I live in to a colony that's totally unrelated to me, but might be somewhere nearby. So there are a few ways that this can happen. One of them is the drift. Your bees are going to fly out of their infested hive, they're going to come home, and they're going to say, I don't really remember where I live. I'm not quite sure where I'm supposed to be. Is it this box or is it that one? Why don't I try that one? And they'll wander right in. So that's a way that we know varroa mites can spread. We know that bees drift. Sometimes bees can drift quite a lot, uh, and so they can spread mites that way. Another way that you can spread mites is through robbing. If I've got healthy bees in my healthy colony, and they find a weak colony, maybe <coughs> the colony is weak because it's full of varroa mites, uh, they might go in and overwhelm the guards, steal some honey, and head home. But unfortunately, while they do that, they could also be picking up varroa mites. Those mites could be jumping onto the robbers and riding them home. Uh, and so I, I think it's important when we talk about robbing to make sure that everyone understands that there are different forms of honeybee robbing. So this is what we call overt robbing, or obvious robbing. It's pretty straightforward. When we look at this animation, and just this photograph here, of these big clumps of bees all desperately trying to you know, pull, uh, cram themselves into this entrance, this is, this is a robbing event that any of us would notice in our apiaries. But there's also what we call covert robbing this more subtle form of robbing that you might not notice if you're just walking through the bee yard. And so what I want to, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the background on this hive here. What we have here is a hive that contains bees that are all cordial. They're all basically blonde. They're very, very light yellow in color. So the only bees that live there are yellow. If you look closely, as this repeats, we're going to see some black bees who are also trying to get in. And here we can see a yellow guard bee fighting this black robber bee was trying to come in there. 
Now, I know that, uh, that black bee wasn't from there because I set up an experiment. And in that experiment, I had yellow bees and black bees, and I made sure that they were only all yellow or all black. This was the aftermath of that, the same day that I shot this video. This was the aftermath. I took an outer cover and I put it in front of that hive. And this is how many dead bees I collected at the end of that day. The vast majority of these are actually black bees. These are robber bees who came in and were repelled by these guards. A few days later, these guards got overwhelmed, and this whole colony was completely robbed out. And so I started seeing a lot of yellow bees and no black bees down at the entrance. But it's the kind of thing that you might not notice if you're not looking for it. And so if you say, oh, I don't think robbing has taken place, I don't think robbing could have been spreading my mites, it could have just been that you didn't know what kind of robbing you were for. So as I said, that was part of an experiment where I really wanted to answer this question. How do these rural mites spread through drift and through robbing, and which is more important? How can we control the row spread that way? And so the experiment was pretty straightforward. We had three colonies, and in those colonies, I bred as many varroa mites as I possibly could. Uh, and those colonies were all headed by queens that produced these bright yellow bees, entirely ornament phenotype bees. They were all yellow. So right next to them, one meter to the east and the west, I set up two other colonies. Those colonies had very low white levels. I've been treating them and, and maintaining low white levels. And they had very, very dark bees. These were carnivores, so they all had very, very dark uh, phenotypes. So I had black bees next to yellow bees, and I had sick bees next to clean bees. And I could ask my question, all right, when do I see a yellow bee in the black colony? When do I see a black bee in the yellow colony? And where are these mites going? What if I monitor my levels continuously, what am I going to find? Well, being a good scientist, I, I was trying to answer a couple of questions. So one thing I also wanted to know was whether distance could protect bees. So I set up two more of these black colonies with low mites and dark bees, 50 meters to the east and west. And then I set up two more, 300 meters to the east and to the west. And so what I had now was this array of clean bees with dark color and then sick bees with light color. And I was able to monitor what was actually going on. I don't have time to show you uh, all of the information. This was a paper that's uh, available online. You can just Google my name and you'll find it. Um, but this was the, the takeaway from that experiment. What we learned was that drift was happening continuously. From the moment we put all of these bees together in the apiary, the mite levels in all the black colonies started creeping upwards. And we think that that was, and we also were, were noticing yellow bees that were winding up in all of these dark colonies. The vast majority of the yellow bees were winding up in the ones that were one meter to the east and the west. So the further away you were from the sick colonies, the better protected you were. Um, we also saw robbing. And when the robbing took place, it was sudden and it was brief. We saw a couple of days of that little subtle robbing, and then a few days of really dramatic robbing, where the yellow colonies were basically completely overwhelmed and lost almost all of their honey and most of their varroa mites. In that case, we actually were, were able to confirm that bees from every single one of these black colonies were participating in that robbing. And the mite populations in the bees 300 meters to the east and west, who had been relatively, they kept their mite levels relatively low, over the course of the experiment, suddenly skyrocket. And so robbing can be sudden, and it can happen over a very long distance. And so that might be a more important mite transmission mechanism if we're talking about how my mites get from my apiary to your apiary. So the last thing I like to talk about here, and it's not because it's common, it's just because it's fun, uh, is, is this other idea of how mites can spread. So we've talked about how bees can carry mites from colony to colony, but what about indirect transmission? What if a varroa mite was riding on a bee, and that bee went to a flower, and then that bee got killed by a spider, or, or you know, the, the bee scraped its leg and the varroa mite fell off? Now we've got a varroa mite on the flower. Well, what if a bee from another colony landed on that flower, and then the varroa mite was able to get on it? So this was, a, this was a question that existed in the scientific literature. Jeff Pettis of the USDA had published a paper where he said, look, you know, here we were at the USDA, and a shipment of flowers from the Netherlands came in, refrigerated shipment of, of tulips or lilies or something, and they shook it over a screen like they do during the inspections, they found this mite. And then they took it around to all the labs, and nobody knew what it was until they brought it to the bee lab, and we said, yep, that's a varroa mite, and it's alive. So we've got a live varroa mite on a shipment of flowers from, from the Netherlands, right? We're coming into the US, maybe it's gonna go to an open air flower market, you know, at a, at a market stall somewhere. And the question was, could that varroa mite have gotten onto a bee? Could it have spread some Dutch bee virus into our bees 
that we wouldn't have anticipated and might not have caught. And the answer that he gave was, I don't know, because nobody knows if a varroa mite could even do that. So we set out to, to do this experiment here. The title sort of gives it away. But what you'll see is a varroa mite that we put on a flower, and we were asking you just a simple question. If that mite was on a flower, could it get onto a honeybee? And what we saw was, I think we put 43 mites out on these flowers, and 41 of them <coughs> successfully infested a worker bee so we see this mite turns, she knows that this is a bee, this is a blind animal, but she smells that that's a honeybee. Gets onto the leg, almost seems to jump onto the abdomen, and if you look closely, she actually runs across the top of the bee's abdomen, and then wedges herself down in the bee's waist. She's basically put herself in a spot that the bee can't bend her rigid legs to actually scratch. So when that bee flies home and says to the other bees, hey, I've got something weird on me, help me clean it off, they might help dislodge that. But now the mite's where it wants to be. It can run off of those bees, jump on a nurse, or jump into a cell and start reproducing. So that's not a common mite transmission mechanism. You shouldn't mow down all the flowers or your aviary to prevent mite transmission. But it does show us that these mites are very good at spreading. And even if you build a totally, totally mite-free aviary, and you chase away all of your neighbors to you know, two or three kilometers away, so there's no drift and there's no rock, you could still have one of these very rare mite transmission events take place, and you wind up with mites all over again. So these are all the natural mechanisms of mite transmission. But of course, there's also non-natural mite transmission that we have to worry about. As beekeepers, whenever we move equipment from one hive to another, particularly when we're moving bees or moving brood, we're almost guaranteed to be moving mites from one colony to another. And so we have to understand that our practices also influence whether or not a sick colony over here is spreading its mites to the, the previously healthy colony over there. So my summary of all of this, this transmission conversation, is, is this. Drift is happening, and it's happening constantly, and it can be very simple. A lot of bees can move from hive to hive, and therefore a lot of mites. But it's most important over really short distances. You probably have a lot of drift happening within your apiary. You might not have all that much drift happening between Robbing is sporadic, but it can happen over a very long distance, and it can happen very quickly. You can go out and kill all of the mites in your, in your colonies in September, but if they go and rob somebody's bees down the road you know, uh, on September 15th, on September 16th, if you went out and did a mite check, you might find an awful lot of raw mites in there. And you might even consider treating again to knock down that, that influx of the robbing. Um, what we learned here is that the sicker a hive is, probably the better it is at transmitting mites. Because the sicker you are, the less able you are to defend yourself against getting robbed. And so in that paper, we suggested that maybe instead of calling these things mite bombs, a sick colony that, that blows up mites and, and bees out into all the other colonies, maybe we should call them robber wars. But they're sitting there, and they're, they're sort of this attractive bait that these robbers can't resist. But while they're there stealing honey, they're also picking up these parasites and the viruses they carry. Um, we can imagine that if, if I was a honeybee living out in the forest, and the next honeybee colony was a kilometer away, and the next one was a kilometer away, and I'm in an ash tree, and you're in an oak tree, and you're in a pine tree, we're probably not going to drift all that much. We're probably not going to get confused and go, did I live 40 feet up an ash tree or, or 80 feet up in an oak tree? I can't remember. I'll just wander in here. We also probably have less robbing happening out in these forests as well. And so that probably helps to protect bees that are living away from, from honeybee management. But it's not enough to completely prevent transmission, because these mites are really good at what they do. And so you're not going to keep your bees isolated. If you have bees, you have mites. And even if you killed every mite, you'd probably wind up with mites pretty soon afterwards. So we have to accept that this is something for us to manage. If you're managing your rural mite population, one thing that you might consider is when is robbing and when is drift most likely to happen in your apiary. So in my apiaries, I see the most robbing in, in the end of autumn. When I've got bees looking to forage, the last of the goldenrod flowers have been killed by an early frost, it's warm weather, but there's no flowers. And there's no more flowers coming until spring. So what are those foragers going to do? They're going to rob or they're going to waste their time. Those are their only options. So that's the point where I'm particularly worried about robbing happening in my college. Um, when does drift occur? Well, it, it can happen whenever your bees fly. Every time they leave a hive, there's a chance that they'll make a mistake and come back to the wrong one. But what makes drift more common, more likely to happen? Well, if all of your colonies are identical, if all of your colonies face in the exact same direction, 
if all of your colonies are, are completely, your apiary is completely devoid of landmarks, you don't have any tufts of grass or pink lawn flamingos or anything to give your bees something to orient from, then if I'm the, the bee who lives in a big long line of, of white colonies, if I fly out of the hive on the right, I know I can just come back and go into the hive on the right. If I can leave the hive on the left, I know I live on the hive on the left. But if I live in, you know, hive seven out of 25, there's not a lot that's gonna keep me from going into hive eight or hive six when I'm coming home. And so we expect that the drift is something that beekeepers could manage if you adjust your apiary design a little bit. You know, don't have all of your colonies face south. Why not have one face southeast and one face southwest? That gives those bees a slightly different approach pattern and it gives a drifting bee one more chance to go, this doesn't feel right, oh, I live over here. It's also important to remember, if you've got no mites nearby, you've got no mite transmission. So if you're the only beekeeper in the county, then as long as your mites are under control, all mites are under control. If you live in a neighborhood with a lot of beekeepers and a lot of bees, then there is probably going to be mite transmission if somebody's got a lot of growing mites. So you want to reduce your chances for drift and robbing, and you want to reduce the number of mite-infested colonies. <coughs> if you find that you've got one colony that's got a lot of mites, you should probably treat the whole apiary, because the odds are good that those mites have already been spreading throughout the apiary. If you've got neighbors who are keeping bees and they're not managing their varroa mites well, you might have a conversation with them. You might try to figure out what it is they're doing and offer some advice on ways that they can improve. And if you've got wild bees, feral bees, living out in your neighbor's chimney or out in, out in you know, the, the, uh, the hollow tree on your, the corner of your property, you might consider the fact that they could be a source of varroa mites. And remember that if you kill all of your mites at the end of the season, you better be double checking to make sure that no new mites have crept in from them going off and robbing one of those wild colonies. One thing I do like to point out here, one, one device that I find useful in this uh, enterprise, is robbing screens. A robbing screen, there's a few different designs of it, is just a, a piece of material that you put over the front of your hive's entrance. And what it does is, in either design, you've got this sort of mesh, this perforation, down near the entrance, down near the, the open, um, honey smelling entrance of that hive. And a robber bee is going to be attracted to that smell. And they're going to say, hey, there's free honey in there. And they're going to come in, and they'll just bump into the bottom of this screen. And they're not able to get in. They have no, no means to enter the hive. Because little does that robber know, but all of the bees that live in here have figured out, that they need to walk up underneath that screen across the surface of the hive and pop up out of this little trap door. Or same thing right here. They, need, they know that they need to navigate that couple of extra inches away, and then they can come and go as they please. And it seems surprising to imagine that if I've got these living with one of these robber screens, and they go try to rob the colony next door that has the exact same robber screen on, you'd think, well, they know how it works. They'll just go in the top and, and go and rob. They don't. They go here. They get attracted to the smell. Because when they're robbers, they're not thinking, this is my home and it has a similar design. They're just going in and saying, something smells like honey, I would like to steal it. So a robbing screen can be a really good way to prevent your hives getting robbed. If you've got neighbors that aren't managing their varroa mites, maybe the, the best thing that will come with that conversation is that you say, hey, why don't I give you a couple of robbing screens? Then that, that'll protect your honey from my bees because I'm worried mine might be really hungry. And maybe that'll keep their mites where they belong. So uh, let's talk a little bit about monitoring for varroa mites. What are the different strategies that you can and should be using to figure out whether you've got them and, and more likely how many you so what I'd like you to do is just turn to your neighbor for a second. I want you to, to try to answer two questions. What valuable information do you get if you measure your mite levels before you treat for varroa mites? And then what valuable information do you get if you monitor after you treat? So talk amongst yourselves, chat, come up with an answer to, to both of these. I'll, I'll call on a couple of groups. <laughs>
Okay, let's, let's see if we've got answers to these questions. Question one is what valuable information do I get if I measure my bite levels before I treat? Anybody? Fred? Right, and so so what, what might I learn if I have a low count on my bite? Uh, what might I conclude? Uh, may not and treatment costs money, and it stresses my bees. It might kill some of the weaker bees in the colony, and maybe I don't need to do that if I don't need to treat. And so if I think it's time to do a varroa treatment, it's probably a good idea to check and make sure that it really is, because I might be able to save me and my bees some stress and some, some expense. What do we learn when we monitor the mite levels after we treat. Was it effective? Was it effective? That's it. If you're buying some, some magical mite killing device or some magical mite killing chemical and you're spreading it all over your hives and then you're confident that you've killed all your varroa mites but you never double check, then you just bought whatever the salesman sold you. You need to go in and figure out whether or not you've actually got good mite control. If you said, I need mite levels to be below 2%, they're at 3% and then you apply a treatment you don't go back in and double check, well, they might be at 2.5%. You haven't done what you aimed to do. So let's talk about some of these monitoring strategies. The first one, as I already said, is the, uh, the visual inspection technique, or as I like to call it, the looking for them technique. <laughs> Did you look for parole? Did you find parole mites? Did you monitor for parole mites? Yeah, I monitored every time I opened the hive. Um, the problem with this is what we already talked about. It's that the mites that are underneath the brood caps are underneath the brood caps. You won't see them. The mites that are riding around on the bees are on the underside of the bees, wedged underneath their overlapping armored plates on their abdomen. And so you're not going to see them either. If you happen to see one or two varroa mites walking on the comb or back on the thorax of a bee, that doesn't really mean that you've got a good sense of how many mites you have. So what are the good methods that I recommend? There are three, and they're all useful, but there are pros and cons to each other. One of them is the alcohol wash method. It's almost foolproof. You're going to kill 300 bees to do it. And so you and the bees need to be comfortable with that. There's the sugar shake method. There's a lot of room for error here, but the 300 bees that you use don't necessarily get killed in the process. So that might be more appealing if you don't want to kill 300 of your bees. Um, and then there's the screened bottom board with a sticky board stuck underneath it. This is a passive measurement. You just put that underneath the colony. You come back and see how many dead parole might spell. It's less accurate, though, because if I've got a colony that's got five frames of bees and a colony that's got 50 frames of bees, and I pull out two boards and I say, oh, you've got 10 mites and you've got 10 mites, that must mean your infestation level is the same. It really isn't. So you wind up having to do a lot more math and guesstimating when you, when you use that screen bottom board. So it can work well. You, you stick in a screen board, all the hive detritus falls underneath it. You take a plastic board, you spray olive oil cooking spray on it, and then you know, pull it out typically three days later, and you count how many varroa mites have fallen. So I recommend doing this for three days because, you know, a hive can have a weird day. Maybe a lot of mites fall, maybe not a lot fall. But if you do it over the course of 72 hours and then you divide by three, you can figure out the average number of mites that fall each day. Then there are these two sample-based methods, which are more accurate, but they require a little more work. In both of them, you're going to take a sample of 300 bees. Conveniently, scientists have spent a lot of tedious time counting bees and measuring bees, and we figured out that a half cup of bees and 300 bees are the same. So if you can get yourself a half cup of bees, you've got 300 of them. You can take a jar and just sort of scrape it down over, the, over a brood frame like this. You can also shape that brood frame into a bin and then take a measuring cup and scoop your half cup of bees out. That's how I prefer to do it. As long as you're sure that the queen isn't in that sample, Better make sure she's not there, because there's nothing fun about alcohol washing a queen. Um, you, can, you can get your, your sample and, and proceed to the next step. So for the sugar shake, what you're going to do is you're going to take those 300 bees, you're going to put them in your jar that has a, a size 8 hardware mesh, hardware cloth cover on top of it. Uh, and you can just put an insert into a canning jar, a little piece of that, that hardware mesh that the mites would fall through and bees fall. And then you add about two tablespoons, one height to the scoop, have to be that precise. A powdered sugar that you just bought at the store, perfection of sugar. Here's the trick. You then toss that a little bit, make sure all the bees are covered in sugar, and then you set it down. And you set it down and you walk away for two minutes. And this is the step that most people 
forget, and it's where most of these sugar shakes fail. Because when I take a bee and I throw powdered sugar on it, all of the mites don't magically pop off the bee. What's actually happening here, the work that makes this whole, this whole method actually function, is that while these bees are sitting in there for two minutes covered in powdered sugar, they're buzzing their wings, they're grooming themselves, and they're getting all hot and bothered. They're getting all upset. They increase their body temperature as they angrily buzz their wings. And that says to the varroa mite that's in there feeding on that bee, happily slurping out nutrition, uh oh, my bee's getting ready to fly. My bee's going crazy. Something must be wrong. I better back out of here and find a call of a bee to ride on. Well, when that happens, now the varroa mite is on this bee. The bee's covered in powder. It makes it harder for the mite to, to cling to the bee. And those bees are actively grooming themselves. So you've basically created a perfect storm for the mites, but it only works if you leave them long enough for the bees to actually get those mites to back out and start getting dislodged. So once we do that, all you're going to do is take your jar full of bees, powdered sugar, and mites, and you're going to shake it into your same handy white plastic bin. You're going to shake it hard, and you're going to shake it for at least a minute. And the goal there is to really get those, you know, those bees should be moving. They should be bouncing off the top and the bottom. You're not going to bruise a bee. You know, right? They've got exoskeletons. They'll be okay. So you can really shake them pretty darn hard. And your goal is to knock all of the mites and as much of that sugar as you can out of the jar. Now we've got a jar, or, or rather a bin, that's full of sugar and mites. You spray a little bit of water on it, the sugar dissolves, the mites don't. And I can count how many raw mites I have per three. It's a method that works if you do it correctly. But if your bees are full of nectar, or if it's raining or even very humid outside, that powdered sugar is just going to clump. If you don't make sure that you leave them for the correct amount of two minutes for them to really dislodge those mites, if you don't shake it quite firmly enough, you might not detect all of the mites that are in there. And so there is a much easier method in the alcohol wash. We take our sample of 300 bees, or half cup of bees, we put them into some container, we pour rubbing alcohol on them, the mites are dead, bees are dead, we swirl or swish or, or, or filter the mites and the bees away from one another, and we wind up with this. We have a bunch of rural mites floating in alcohol, this colony needs to be treated. You can do that with something like this. This is the Varroa Easy Check. It's got a little, a little white um, sort of mesh strainer in there that you put the bees in, and then you swirl it around and all the mites and the alcohol fall down underneath it, and you can scoop that out and throw away the dead bees. You can also just do something like this. This is Randy Oliver's blog, and uh, he just uses a, a mesh colander. He puts a sample of 300 bees in there and sort of swishes and swirls it around to try to get all of the mites down underneath uh, the bowl. So there are different methods you can use, but, but killing bees with alcohol and then swirling around to get those mites separated from the bees isn't a half bad method to figure out how many mites you've got from 300 bees. Here are some signs that your varroa situation has already gone too Sometimes people will say, uh-oh, I'm worried I have mites. I've got a bunch of bees that have these wing deformities, which can be caused by a number of things, but they are largely caused, or most often caused, that you report them by deformed wing virus, one of those mite-transmitted viruses that can really devastate a colony. Well, the problem is, by the time I've got 40 bees crawling around with, with severely deformed wings, that's not because only 40 bees have deformed wing virus. All of my bees have it. These are the bees who got so bad so early in their development that they couldn't even develop their wings properly. If I get rid of those 40 bees, I haven't eliminated the virus. All of my bees are probably suffering from pretty dangerously high levels, and their lifespans are going to be too short. So at this point, it's probably too late for me to manage my varroa and have, be able to more or less guarantee success in that colony. This is another thing that people sometimes report. They say, uh-oh, I got that PMS, I got, I got parasitic mite syndrome, uh, I've got all of these brood that have been chewed open, the bees are trying to scoop out all of the brood, it looks like they may also have some viruses off on the side. And when the colony's health really starts to fail, you can actually see multiple diseases all coming in at once. You see a Euro European fowl brood crop up in a colony that really just has a terrible varroa infestation. Because suddenly the bees whose job is to detect a, a sick larva and pull it out aren't able to do that for the bacterial disease or the, the fungal disease, the chalk brood up in this corner. Because they're so focused on all of these bees that are dying from varroa and the varroa transmitted viruses. So again, if you get to a point like this, you can't say, well, now it's time for me to do my varroa management, because you've already really missed the boat. So we've talked about varroa mites for a while here. We haven't really talked about killing them. We've just talked about 
understand it. What is it that we've learned that will help you control and manage your rural populations? Well, we know that they can either be phoretic on the bees, or they can be reproductive in the brood. This is a very rough approximation. But we can, you can think that there's probably most of the time going to be about half of the, the mites are riding the bees, half of the mites are reproducing. We know sometimes of years the vast majority of the mites are actually in the brood reproducing. And of course we know that during the fall and winter, when there is no brood, all of the mites have to be riding on the bees. But for the most part, for most of the summer, you, you have, you know, roughly half of the mites doing one thing and half doing the other at any given time. We know that it's really easy to measure the mite population, but it's quite hard to guess it. So if you don't know what your mite levels are, you can't just sit there and scratch your head. You've got to do something and figure it out. We know that mites reproduce better on... Uh,